In its time, the Dragon Pit was a marvel of the world. Full-grown Targaryen dragons nested beneath its massive dome. And even on the darkest nights, the walls seemed to glow with the fire of the great beasts inside. As had the site's previous occupant, the Sept of Remembrance, when Maegor the Cruel blasted it with dragon fire during morning prayers. The screams of the dying men echoed through King's Landing all day, and a pall of ash and smoke hung over the city for a week. But as it dissipated, so too did the rebellion of the Faith Militant. The Sept of Remembrance faded from memory, and Magor decided to replace a monument to the gods with a monument to his family, the Dragon Pit. Labor proved elusive, however, for after the Red Keep was finished, Magor had hosted a three-day feast for all the builders, stonemasons, and carpenters who had worked to build it. At its conclusion, he slaughtered them, so that only he would know the castle's secrets. So many men fled the construction of the Dragon Pit that Magor was forced to employ the prisoners of the city dungeons, supplemented by skilled and ignorant builders from across the narrow sea. For more than a century, the Targaryens housed their dragons in the Dragon Pit. But dragons are not horses to be stabled or hounds to be kenneled. With each generation, the dragons became less, less massive, less swift, less long-lived. And less invulnerable. During the Dance of Dragons, two Targaryen factions killed a handful of their family's dragons while fighting each other. A frenzied mob even broke into the dragon pit and slaughtered the five dragons chained there though the last managed to bring down the roof of the Great Dome on its assailants. The dragons never recovered their former strength or numbers. Perhaps their line had been too broken. Or perhaps others intervened to break it further. But the last dragon grew no larger than a cat, and its death earned Aegon, third of his name, the epithet Dragonbane. What is a dragon pit without dragons? The roof remained where it had fallen. The great bronze doors rusted and fell off their hinges. Prostitutes cavorted where fantastic creatures had once fed and slept. Then came Daenerys. Now dragons once again darken the sky, but they will never darken the dragon pit again. Daenerys has learned the folly of chaining her dragons. The Dragon Pit is, and will remain, a ruin of a bygone age, when kings and queens flew high above their countrymen. Hey everybody, as requested, New Game of Thrones talking about some more Targaryen history this time. We saw a little bit of this play out during the course of Season 7, and some of the things that Jon Snow and Daenerys talked about, and also some visual metaphors mirroring events that have happened on the TV show thus far, with Cersei the Cruel, Maegor the Cruel, if you are finding me for the first time, be sure to subscribe to get everything. We're doing videos till season 8 gets here, and I'm still doing that DVD giveaway I'll explain at the end of the video. But starting with the really fun stuff first. So Maegor the Cruel is the Targaryen king that built the dragon pit, but it all came after this build-up in Faith Militant Uprising, which is very similar to the things that happened during season 6 of the TV show. His rise to power was just as bloody and backstabbing as Cersei's rise to power. He took power from his brother Aenys I, who you could kind of consider a weak, indecisive king that allowed the faith to gain enough power to create the faith militant, the first faith militant uprising. As things started to spiral out of control, chaos is a ladder style, that's when Maegor took his moment to seize power, the same way Cersei seized power by blowing up the Great Sept. But just to put it in context, they were the sons of Aegon the Conqueror. So this is happening right after Aegon the Conqueror has died. His son Aenys becomes king. He's somewhat of a weak king. So circumstances lead to a faith militant uprising that Maegor then seizes power and puts down using the dragons to blow up the great sept of the day, which was called the Sept of Remembrance that they talk about in this clip. So he basically tore down what was the symbol of the people's faith and put the symbol of his family's power in its place. So it's like, I'm gonna build the dragon pit here. But he had also been finishing the Red Keep in a very Red Wedding-y type twist, killed everybody at the great feast that he held after it was done. 
You see how George R. R. Martin weaves themes in and out of history. Names recur, events seem very similar to events that happened in the past. The Lannisters send their regards. Magor sends his regards. But because he'd killed off all these skilled laborers to protect the secrets of the Red Keep, he had to scrape the bottom of the barrel to build the dragon pit. But he did get overseers from Mir and Volantis, which is why you see a lot of visual similarities to the Great Pit of Dasnak when the dome isn't on top of it. Like at the end of this clip, Varys says, what is a dragon pit without dragons? It looks an awful lot like Dasnak's pit, the Colosseum. But then the longer they'd been chained up, as you've heard, they grew weaker and weaker, slowly dying off. I love the way that when Kyburn's narrating this, he also implies that people within the inner circle also hasten the demise of the dragons. So on top of the fact that they were just genetically becoming weaker and weaker, there were also people that slowly tried to kill them off even faster. But the Dance of the Dragons is probably the single most cataclysmic event in the eventual downfall of the dragons themselves. Just because there are so many dragons on different factions killing each other. So within the span of a few years, you lose a lot of your dragons. In addition to a bunch of the peasants storming the dragon pit and killing the five remaining ones that were staying there. But side note, the Dance of the Dragons is also one of the leading candidates for the prequel series that they're developing. There are a couple notable events in history that George R. R. Martin has already said that they're not doing for the prequel series. The Dance of the Dragons is one of the few big ones that he hasn't said anything about, just meaning that it's still on the list. As the last of the dragons that had been housed in the dragon pit were being killed by the peasants, one of them actually belonged to a prince named Joffrey Valerion, which is just Funny thinking about Joffrey in present day. Names recur several times throughout history, so it's just funny to hear that there was a Joffrey of the day. But you all probably remember that moment where Jon Snow hands that tiny little dragon skull to Daenerys. Kyber narrates that the final dragon was no larger than a cat. So you just picture a surpounce sized dragon running around the Red Keep chasing around other cats. That would actually be pretty funny. But because the king of the time, Aegon III, was named Dragonbane, it's a good reminder that the affectations that the citizens give the kings and queens aren't always meant to honor them. Sometimes they're meant to mock them. Like Magor being called Magor the Cruel was not a name to imply how awesome he was. Cersei finally becoming queen, getting what she wants, sounds like she's also headed for a name that will mock her. Even though you got what you wanted, everybody hates you and you're left alone. The other funny thing, though, is that when Varys says, you know, what is a dragon pit without dragons? See, the door's blown off, talking about how it's just left in ruins. It was later used by prostitutes entertaining their customers, which is a funny image, by vagrants just sleeping there, homeless people just camping out. But probably the last big thing that it was used for in a practical sense was as a mass grave during a big outbreak of the plague. They called it the Great Spring Sickness. It happened about 100 years before events on the TV show paints a very specific picture for what the possible future of the kingdom is. In King's Landing alone, over a million people that could be turned into the army of the dead. Just like massive numbers of people died during the Great Spring Sickness. But getting into season 8 stuff actually, people were talking about how the actors will be in places that they've never been before. Even though I want to see Cersei stay relatively local to the Red Keep just because that place is so important to her. The Iron Throne has been so important to her this whole time. I would love to see her sitting in the ruins of it during this Daenerys vision here, making this come to pass in some twist on the Night King making it to King's Landing. But if they have confirmed that all of the main actors will be going places that they'd never gone before, it just implies that eventually Cersei will either board one of Euron's ships and they'll sail somewhere else, or she'll be somewhere else in Westeros. They say all the main actors are going places they'd never been before. What do you think that means for Cersei's character, who has not left King's Landing since season one? Literally, the last time that she was not in King's Landing was in the first two episodes of the series during season one when they went to Winterfell and then in episode two when they were still on their way back to King's Landing. Thank you so much for watching. Everybody stay awesome. I'll see you guys tonight. Hold up.